Greetings, Church, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is Sermon 2. We'll cover chapters 2, verse 6 to 6, 14. They sell the needy for sandals. At the start of the book, the prophet Amos prophesied against the neighbours of Israel. His listeners would have enjoyed it. Amos was criticising their enemies. Imagine a Malaysian in Singapore criticising Vietnam, Cambodia, Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia. Now some Singaporeans would be very entertained. But little did they know that God speaking through Amos was doing all that to tie a noose around Israel's neck. Amos' prophecies against Israel's neighbours went in a systematic geographical manner, starting from Damascus in the northeast of Israel to Gaza in the southwest, Tyre in the northwest, Edom in the south, Ammon in the east, Moab in the southeast, and then Judah in the south. And on the map, you'll see that Amos is zooming in closer and closer to Israel each time. Now, we tend to observe other people to see their sins, whereas God uses other people to show us our sins. And thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke the punishment. God uses the same pattern of pronouncement against Israel. Israel is not treated exceptionally from her neighbours, even though Israel was God's covenantal people. Indeed, all the more because Israel was supposed to be God's covenantal people, were well, they held to be a higher standard. And that's perhaps why most of Amos' prophecy is God's chastisement of Israel's many sins. Now remember the two universal moral truths or principles violated by Israel's neighbours. First, mistreating fellow human beings made in the image of God. And two, breaking covenant. Those are the same sins of Israel, but worse, mistreating their own people and breaking covenant with God. Social injustice, sexual immorality and religious hypocrisy. That's pretty much a summation of all their sins. So in chapters two, verse, uh, chapter 2, verses eight, 6 to 8, we are given some details of these. And, and so these subsequent passages throughout chapters 2 to 6 are elaboration and variations of these same themes. And so verse 6 says, Because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, those who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and turn aside the way of the afflicted. Now imagine the imagery here. They sold the innocent needy for cheap sandals. Now in those days, if a person owes you money, you could sue the person in court, enforce judgment and sell the person into slavery. Now this selling of the poor is a reference to debt slavery, which was instituted in the Mosaic Law. It was intended to be a redemptive institution to help rehabilitate those who become bankrupt. Originally the intent was that if someone owed so much debt to a person, the creditor can make that person a debt slave for six years which means that the creditor must give the debt slave accommodation, food, water, and take proper care of him and his family, and pay him salary at half the rate. And so this means that the bankrupt and his family will not be homeless or starving on the streets. And then on the seventh year, the Sabbath year, the creditor must release the slave and his family, and I quote, Furnish him liberally out of your flock, out of your threshing floor, and out of your winepress. As the Lord your God has blessed you, you shall give to him. But the sinfulness of Israel turned this redemptive, grace-filled institution into an oppressive, exploitative system. Now imagine selling a poor woman who owed you $50 as a slave so that you can buy a pair of touching slippers. Imagine grabbing a poor woman's head and plunging it forcefully into the mud. Or imagine you were just a passerby and you see this poor woman sobbing in pain by the road. What do you do? You turn aside and look the other way. Verse 7 says, A man and his father go into the same girl so that my holy name is profaned. Father and son had sex with the same girl. It may be that they were having sex with or raping a female slave or they were having adultery with the same woman. Either way, it violates God's holiness because in God's design, sex is reserved only within the exclusive marriage covenant between a husband and a wife. And then verse 8 says, They lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge, and in the house of their God they drink the wine of those who have been fined. The people of Israel exploited the poor by seizing their clothes as collateral or security like a mortgage for loans. Now the law of Moses specifically said that lenders cannot seize the clothes of the poor to enforce the collateral or security. 
because otherwise during winter time they would freeze it's like today by right certain personal items like clothes and your hdb flat cannot be taken by a lender if a debtor becomes a bankrupt although of course hdb can seize your flat if you can't service your hdb mortgage um, the people of israel not only seized the clothes of the poor they even laid down on these clothes at the altar in the temple of god and used the fines or penalties charged on these poor debtors in court to go and buy wine and drink in the temple this also suggests that the people were very religious they would go to the equivalent of church every sunday small group bible study and sing worship songs and serve while in church drinking expensive wines and drinking and driving expensive cars that were paid for by money from the poor money from the unfair exploitation of the needy who had to work for pittance out of desperation and we must also pause to reflect on our own present day circumstances now most of, most of us don't feel rich or powerful and of course i hope none of us are having sexual affairs outside marriage or non-sexual adultery but you have to understand that some of Amos's oracles are hyperboles they are stuck images meant to illustrate general sometimes subtler realities in the sermon on the mount jesus said to simply lust is to commit adultery and in talking about turning the other cheek and walking the extra mile jesus is suggesting among other things that to exercise one's power for self-profit at the expense of other people is unbecoming are we guilty of lust of flirtation of violating an exclusive marriage covenant of infidelity to the relationships we have been given are we guilty of using our power to push others down of mistreating those who are weaker than us in our businesses in our purchasing choices do we benefit from unfair exploitation of these weaker people are we guilty of turning away turning aside from the way of the afflicted of the needy looking away from those in need who today are examples of the weak and those in need generally employers are, are more powerful than employ employees um, in other words employees are weaker than employers subordinates are weaker than managers people with disabilities are weaker than non-people with disabilities low-wage foreigners are weaker than locals the less educated and less wealthy are often the ones in need for example domestic helpers in our homes and low-wage migrant workers recently in the course of my volunteering work helping migrant work workers i received calls from for help from domestic helpers who are not given enough food who are made to work terribly long hours with, with little rest i hear from migrant construction workers who are packed 30 in a room, not paid their salaries, terminated from employment the moment that the circuit breaker happened, disallowed by employers for no reason from buying groceries, data top-up cards, to talk to families. Their stories have been all over the news. How have we looked away from the least of these? And then chapter 2 verse 9 says, Yet it was I, God, who destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and who was as strong as the oaks. I destroyed his fruit above and his roots beneath. Also, it was I who brought you up out of the land of Egypt and led you 40 years in the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. And I raised up some of your sons for prophets and some of your young men for Nazarites. Is it not indeed so? O people of Israel, declares the Lord. In chapter 2, verses 9 to 11, God reminds Israel of three truths that makes them who they are as a nation and people. It was God who gave them their land. God gave Israel victory over the Amorites who possessed the promised land prior to Israel. Two, it was God who freed them from slavery in Egypt to become a free people. And three, it was God who raised prophets up within Israel to speak to them God's word, revelation. Without these three distinctives and acts, Israel was nothing, no land, no freedom, no revelation. And then chapter 3, verses 1 onwards, it says, Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family that I brought up out of the land of Egypt. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. The fundamental existence and identity of Israel was predicated on God's choice or election to enter into an intimate covenantal relationship with them as a nation. You know, the word know is used in the Old Testament not just to mean cognitively having information, but to understand, to care about, to look out for, and even to have sex with. In Genesis chapter 4, it said that Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived. And that was how intimate God knew Israel. And that was how intimate God Israel was supposed to be with God. Now, the word families here refers to clans, tribes, ethnic nation, people groups. 
out of all the people groups, Israel alone was privileged to enjoy this unique, intimate relationship with God. A unique identity and a unique privilege entail a unique responsibility. And for Israel, that was to bear witness to the justice and righteousness of God by obeying and living out His justice and righteousness. This unique vocation or calling upon Israel was intended to be a missional one. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 5 to 8, it was explained that God's intent for Israel as the chosen nation was that if they had obeyed the just and righteous laws of God, all the foreign nations would have looked at Israel and said, Wow, what a great and just God! We should go and learn from them. But Israel failed. And for failing this, Israel would bear a unique punishment. We need to consider how this applies to us today. Whether or not you believe that the church has replaced Israel in the ancient covenants, or the church is part of the expanded notion of the party to the covenant, the scriptures tell us that if a person is a true follower of Jesus, the person is chosen or elected. We need to ask ourselves what unique responsibility this unique privilege entails for us individually and as a church. I believe the New Testament applies the missional calling to us as New Covenant Christians and the Church in the same way that the Old, Covenant, uh, Old Testament Israel was given this vocation. We need to ask ourselves, how are we as individuals and as a Church fulfilling our unique God-given missional responsibility? And then in chapter 2 verse 12, it goes on to say, But you made the Nazarites drink wine and commanded the prophets, saying, You shall not prophesy. Israel refused to listen to their prophets and Nazarites. By doing so, they were rejecting their very identity as people who have the word of God. Nazarites like Samson and the prophet Samuel are people consecrated to serve God by a vow to not cut their hair and, to, and, and not drink alcohol. Amos suggested that Israel made the Nazarites break their sacred vow by drinking wine. Now, it could have been physically forcing them to drink wine, or it may not be. But does it matter? It's all the same to coax and tempt the Nazarites is a subtle, sinister, and perhaps more effective way to reject the Word of God. And you see this today in the, in the wider church and outside the church as well. People don't want to hear God's Word for what it is, and so they move to another church that tells them things they want to hear. If a church starts talking about justice for the poor and the migrant, people move to another church. If a church starts talking about which Bible translation is right, they split church or they pick from the buffet of preachers and writers online and listen to what they want to hear. Or outside of the church, when a society refuses to listen to advocates calling out for justice, they label these advocates as troublemakers. They find legal or non-legal ways to humiliate these advocates. They even create laws to silence these advocates. Even, even within the wider church, you see influential Christian figures unkindly denouncing weaker voices for alleged unorthodoxy. A famous pastor and preacher once made an infamous tweet and never apologized even, or uh, even tried to engage the other person about his views. Of course, of course orthodoxy is important, but if we do not even listen and engage with others, then there can only be one orthodoxy, correct? And that is your own orthodoxy, your own views. Everyone else must be wrong. And that has always been the problem of the relationship between God's people and the prophets. The people were the mainstream, and the prophets were the lone voice at the margins, treated as heresy. It is only with perfect vision of hindsight that the prophets are validated. Pride refuses to listen. Pride refuses to listen. Intellectual arrogance, spiritual pride are the fruit of Satan. We need to check our own pride, our own obstinance, and actively listen to prophets and voices from the margins if we find ourselves going along with the mainstream culture, whether it is of the world or of the church, we should be worried. And so by mistreating their fellow human beings made in the image of God, by breaking their word, by violating covenant with God, by failing to live justly and righteously, the people of Israel were actively rejecting God. They were pointing the finger at God. And then in chapter 3, verses 3 to 6, God asks a series of rhetorical questions. Do two walk together unless they have agreed to meet? Does a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Does a young lion cry out from his den if he has taken nothing? Does a bird fall in the snare of the earth when there is no trap for it? Does a snare spring up from the ground when it has taken nothing? Is a trumpet blown in the city and the people are not afraid? 
does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? The point of the questions is that obviously there is a cause for every effect. Disaster will come to Israel and it is God who causes it. And God will bring disaster because Israel had broken their covenant. And chapter 3, verses 7 to 8 says, For the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. The lion has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? And true to his nature, God never judges without warning or giving opportunity for repentance. God has roared. Can we hear and not fear? God has spoken. Can his prophets remain silent? For as Christians in the light of Jesus' promise of judgment and salvation, we need to hear this and prophesy. And that means to speak forth his word. We need to speak forth the word of Jesus. We need to prophesy the word of Jesus. God has revealed his plans for the last days. There will be a final judgment there will be tribulation, there will be a day of reckoning, there will also be salvation and a consummation of a new heaven and new earth. We need to speak forth this word. We cannot remain silent. On judgment day, will the people in our lives look at us and say, why did you not tell me? Or will they say, I should have listened to you? Or will they stand beside us among those whose names are in the book of life and not death? And then 3, verses 9 to 10 says, Proclaim to the strongholds in Ashdod and to the strongholds in the land of Egypt and say, Assemble yourselves on the mountains of Samaria and see the great tumults within her and the oppressed in her midst. They do not know how to do right, declares the Lord, those who store up violence and robbery in their strongholds. And the NIV translates this as, Who store up in their fortresses what they have plundered and looted. God calls on the foreign superpower nations to come and see the oppressed people in Israel. One would have thought that these foreign nations were the most ruthless oppressors, but they would be shocked to even see even worse oppression in Israel. It would be like inviting North Korea to come and see the societal conditions in the United States. Now the rich and powerful in Israel have profited and hoarded wealth from violence, robbery, theft and exploitation. Now this most likely will be figurative language. They probably did not literally rob the poor at knife point and took their money. Instead, the powerful probably exploited the poor and the weak by making them work for pittance. The rich probably lent, the money, um, lent money to the poor and then sued them pantless when they could not pay and then made them lifelong slaves, working in their homes for nothing but meager sustenance, barely enough to keep them alive. And these business people probably cheated the poor by using fixed skills and lies. And we see such great inequality and exploitation in our nation and many rich nations today as well. About the United States, for example, the land of the richest billionaires, one quarter of the world's billionaires are in the United States or Americans. A recent United Nations report says about 40 million Americans live in poverty, 18.5 million live in extreme poverty, and 5.3 million live in third world conditions of absolute poverty. Now 4 verse 1 then says, Hear this word, you cows of Bashan who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor and who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, Bring that we may drink. The modern translation of this verse is rather regrettable. The NL, NLT, the New Living Translation, does worse by portraying these as women as fat cows, dropping the Bashan reference. And actually, these are all interpreted, interpreted translations. So if you see the original language, and the, for example, the KJV translation actually says, Hear this word, ye keen cows of Bashan, that are in the mountain of Samaria, which oppress the poor, which crush the needy, which say to their masters, not husbands, bring and let us drink. The image here is of rich people, rich people in Israel described as cows who oppress the poor and the needy and disdainfully say to their masters, bring us some drinks. Now the modern translation portrays these people as women who order their husbands around. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't condone, condone uh, women ordering their husbands around and I don't condone husbands ordering women, uh, women around like that. I don't condone anyone ordering people, anyone else around like that. But that's not what the original context and what the Hebrew text actually tells us. The Hebrew word, a down translated as husbands in this passage in, in the ESV, is actually usually translated as masters or lords. And while the word for cow is feminine, it's not the point of the verse and may well be how, for example, in our language today, we sometimes refer to the church or a nation as a she. So, the geographical references to cows of Bashan 
and the mountain of Samaria reveals the context and the main focus of this verse. So I'm reading next a quote, a long quote, an excerpt from theologian and Old Testament scholar Ellen Davis uh, from this book, Opening Israel's Scriptures. Quote, An accurate reading of this passage begins with attention to the, to, to the two geographic ancient names for the large agricultural district east of the Sea of Galilee, cattle country in Amos' day. Amos relocates these cows far to the southwest on Mount Samaria, which is the royal citadel in the capital city. They represent the aristocracy gathered around the king, likely a new created class of royal cronies who have been compensated for their political and military services with lands appropriated from peasants who have defaulted on their taxes. So the image sets up a contrast and tension between the small elite class of absentee landowners and everyone else, the small farmers who provide the wine and otherwise supply comforts for the banqueting cultures and the homes of the rich. By shifting a, a attention away from particulars of geography and what they reveal about the agricultural economy and focusing instead on women's bodies, supposedly perceived as fat, the NLT converts Amos' economically treated metaphor into a gender treated one. These cows of Bashan, Israel's power elite, are living off the backs of poor villagers. Amos adds a wry twist to this bovine imagery. In his oracle, the cows, the aristocrats, have their masters at their beck and call. In the sphere of the metaphor, it seems likely that the masters who service the bovine, the cows, are the political and religious leaders who maintain the sanctuaries and keep the streams of agricultural produce flowing for the benefit of the cows. An audience of Israelite farmers might recognize what is implicit in this metaphor. Domesticated cows are loyal to anyone who feeds them. Unquote. So not only are the wealthy class oppressive to the poor, their status, wealth, and power are maintained by their support for the political leaders and elite. And the political elite and leaders, and then what they do is they pass laws and force policies and wield power to benefit the wealthy class. In short, the rich and the powerful maintained oppressive social, political, and economic systems for self-profit. Again, we see this in the world today. Rich corporations and wealthy individuals cozy up to politicians in a symbiotic relationship. The rich pay and support politicians they vote for or promote politicians, and then the politicians pass laws and policies that help the rich get richer, avoid paying more taxes, receive more opportunities for commercial exploitation. Social connections between the rich capital owners and the political, the political um, elite and the politically powerful result in wealth and opportunities concentrated among the elite, excluding the rest of the population, the poor, the needy, the labour class, and even in today's context, the middle working class. And so in chapter 5, verse 10 onwards, it says this, They hate him who reproves in the gate, and they abhor him who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and you exact taxes of grain from him, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions, and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe, bribe and turn aside the needy in the gate, therefore he who is prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. The prevailing culture of Israel reached a point where those who speak truth were hated, those who spoke up were discriminated against, and those who were upright were persecuted. It reached a point where those who saw the injustice going on were so fearful they would be silent because it was an evil time. The rich used corrupt legal systems and lawsuits to dig money from the poor through fines and taxes. Their elders and judges at the gates. And so to explain this, in the Old Testament, the elders of the community sat at the city gates to judge disputes and make political de decisions. And so these elders and judges took bribes. When the needy tried to seek recourse to justice, the elders and the judges dismissed the cases of the poor and the needy. And so in chapter 4, verse 4 to 5 onwards, it says this, Come to Bethel and transgress, to, to Gilgal and multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving for that which is leavened, and proclaim free will offerings. Publish them, for you love to do this, O people of Israel, declares the Lord God. And 5 verse 25 to 27 says, Did you bring to me sacrifices and offerings during the forty years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You shall take up Sikuth your king, 
Kiyun, your star god, your images that you have made for yourselves, and I will send you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. Israel was very religious and very pious. They would give plenty of sacrifices and tithes and free will offerings to God. They would even go over and above what was required. Sacrifices were only supposed to be given on the first morning. They would bring every morning. Tithes were only to be made on the third day. They would bring every three days. They would proclaim and publish, pro 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 probably on the equivalent of our social media today, how much free will offerings they were giving. Now God sarcastically tells them to continue doing this because they love to do this. But these were all a sham, fake religion, foolish piety, false worship. These were the problems of their worship. Three problems. First, it was a political move. It was using religion for politics. Now in 1 Kings chapter 12, it was recorded that after the kingdom of Israel split into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, King Jeroboam of Israel wanted to ensure that his people would not go back down to Jerusalem in the south. He believed that if people continued to make pilgrimage to, the, to Jerusalem, they would descend and want to rejoin Judah. But only Jerusalem was the legitimate sanctuary of the covenant. So the king made two golden calves and set them up at Bethel and Dan, later replaced by Gilgal, and declared, Behold your gods, O Israel! He then set up temples on high places, the mountaintops, and appointed priests who were not Levites. He set up religious feasts that are similar to those in the law of Moses. He even offered sacrifices on the altar in full view of the public as a public relations exercise to score political points. And all of this was in violation of the law of Moses. And the people of Israel flocked to these false temples because it was the more convenient choice. And we continue to see things like that today. Governments and politicians seek to establish their own version of churches and religions which endorse them. They even appoint their own religious leaders. Politicians appearing at religious events or ceremonies, giving talks to religious groups, holding or quoting religious scriptures like the Bible. Politicians offering support to religions and religious organizations in exchange for free will, or rather goodwill and favors. Do not be fooled. The church belongs only to God and shall not serve the political expediency of politicians or governments. If the church cozies up to political powers, supports politicians, enters into pacts or exchanges of favours with political leaders, the church will inevitably be on a downward slide of compromise to idolatry and false worship. The church must fiercely fight for its independence from worldly politics. The church must fiercely fight to keep herself free from the influence of any source of power other than God. The second fundamental problem of Israel, Israel's worship is this. They worshipped other gods. So God described Sikuth, your king, and Kiun, your star god. These were Mesopotamian astral or star gods. Now, your king actually refers to Sikuth as a king of these pagan gods, a god of war and chase and a chief decision maker. Kiun refers to a god that's actually based on the planet Saturn. There is nothing more to be said about this, um, this sin other than that Israel's idolatry again reflects the pursuit of self-profit. Why? Because it's not only not because these gods pr proved themselves to be true or more powerful in any way. These were gods probably from or inspired from the superpower Assyria. And so the people probably thought, wow, you know, these gods enabled Syria to, Assyria to become prosperous and powerful. So let's also go and worship these gods. And then we also will be prosperous and powerful. The irony is that these gods were human-made idols which could be taken up and carried with the people of Israel when they would be later exiled from the land. Imagine the image when Israel would be conquered and driven out of their homes. They would carry their home handmade idols with them. Are we not guilty of this too? We look at people around us in envy and we think, wow, how did this fella become so rich? How did that girl become so famous? How did that company grow so profitable? How did those parents make their children achieve so much? And then we uncritically and unconsciously allow their gods into our hearts. The gods of self-profit, self-pleasure, self-reliance, self-promotion. The gods of the Pharaoh who relentlessly drove slaves to keep working and producing. The, the golden calves of wealth and prosperity, of ostentations, display and materiality. 
the gods of the Babylonian prostitute who made the kings of the earth lie in bed with her in exchange for trade and economic growth and peace who proudly declares that she would never fall. What are the false gods that we unconsciously follow? What are the false gods that we carry with us to school, to work, to our parenting, to our relationships, to our stewardship of money and resources, to our ministries, or to our churches? Now the third fundamental problem is that Israel substituted righteous living for religious piety or performance. We have looked at how Israel oppressed the poor and the needy and maintained oppressive, corrupt, social, economic, political systems for self-profit, while at the same time being very religious and generous in offerings and devoted in piety. This is not mere hypocrisy. This is a com complete contradiction in terms, completely contradictory to God. True religion is righteous living, especially expressed in seeking the interests of others. True religion is faith working through love. And that's why in James, James chapter 1, verse 27 says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. What does this mean for us today? What does God think of us? Well, what God regards as sin in the time of Amos is the very same kind of sins we may be guilty of today, whether it's an individual or the church or a nation or, or as the whole of humanity. And as Christians, the church, called by God, we have a unique missional responsibility. Will we prophesy the word of God? Will we prophesy with just our lips, but not also with our hearts and with our hands? Will we prophesy to the world through our lives of a God who is just and righteous, merciful and compassionate? Or will we prophesy to the world through our conduct, intended or otherwise, of a God who ignores the poor, despises the weak, revels in marital and relational infidelity, promotes falsehood and performs hypocrisy? As the specially chosen image bearers of God, we are a tangible living reflection of God. When we hear God speak through His Word, we can choose to draw near. When we draw closer, we can follow His call, or we can choose to turn away from His call. And when we follow His call, we draw closer to His heart. When we draw closer to His heart, the more of our heart becomes like His heart. When more of our heart becomes like His heart, the more that our life will look like the life of Jesus, the more we will love the last, the lost, and the least around us. When more of our life looks like Jesus' life, the greater our resemblance to God. And when we resemble God, the clearer the heart of God that people around us will see when they look at us. And this is how we may prophesy the heart of God. And this is the mystery that by loving fellow human beings as the image bearers of God, we love God. That by becoming a clearer image bearer of God, we prophesy the heart of God. The greater the pleasure of God, we then experience. And all of that begins in our hearts. And it ends at the ends of the earth. It begins with small things we can do today. It begins with the small people we can take notice of today. When we move on from our religious observances on the weekends to the daily grind of the weekdays, will we hear the roar of the lion ringing in our hearts, calling us to take notice of the people at the margins? Will we pause to say a word of affirmation to our helpers and workers? Will we check in on our colleagues and classmates and ask how they are doing? Just drop the text message and ask, Hi! How are you doing this season? Will we greet and chat with next door neighbours and find out more about their families? Will we smile at and thank our wait staff, our estate, coffee shop, toilet cleaners, bus taxi, private car drivers, migrant labourers and service providers? Will we also critically reflect on our private financial choices? Will we consider intentionally researching organisations that lift up the poor and the needy and give to these groups? Will we look out for our colleagues or employees if they're going to be retrenched? To ask them how they're feeling and coping? To help them find alternative work? 
to give them a love gift for their family to tide through this financially uncertain period? Will we look out for migrant workers in our midst who have been stuck in their dormitories for about six months, many of whom without work and salary, many of them incurred huge debts equivalent to one to two years of their salary just to come to Singapore? They are paid low wages for work that we don't want to do, and by policy and as foreigners, they are only given limited protection when they fall ill or get injured or are not paid their salary, and so we enjoy lower prices and faster results from their cheap labour. And now many of them have been fired and will be sent back Will we bless them with love gifts to support their families back home? Will we live out the Jubilee and help to release some of their debts? Will we reach out to befriend some of these marginalized migrants in our midst? You know, while we were stuck at home during the circuit breaker, many of them had uh, many of us had our own room, if not our own home, and we could go out to buy food that we liked, that we wanted, and so on. For many of our migrant friends, they were stuck in dormitory rooms with 20, 30 other guys with food of varying quality sent to them, not of their choice, and not being able to leave the room for the whole time. And so what I did was I started a platform called WePals where Singaporeans could sign up to connect with migrant workers as friends on Facebook and become pen pals. And since then, we've had 300 plus volunteers, 150 plus pen pals, and 250 plus migrant friends. We had people from all walks of life, races, and religion, joining homemakers, engineers, students, doctors, pastors, young and elderly. And through the connections, we have seen some friendships blossom. We have seen some friends go the extra mile. And I can always tell who are the befrienders who are Christians. They happen to be friends of friends. This pastoral staff from another church went out of his way to help his migrant friend um, arrange to remit money home to his family because the migrant worker could not receive the salary in cash from his employer. Another pastor tried to counsel his migrant friend through the process to get his unpaid salary with the help of MOM, the Ministry of Empower. A few Christians, while juggling their own day jobs, arranged for special deliveries of their migrant friend's favourite food to dom the dormitories. And so here on the slide, you will see pen pal letters exchanged between um, this, this girl, who happens to be a Christian, and a migrant friend. I recently also saw a Facebook post from Operation Mobilisation OM Singapore. One of their personnel, Sam, has always looked out for the Bangladeshi HDB estate cleaners, befriending them, chatting with them. Chinese New Year, Sam reached out to Baya, his friend, invited them, him and his friends, to a home, homely biryani lunch. Baya inv invited you know, his colleagues, and together they had a heartwarming fellowship in Sam's cozy home. And you know, sometimes we wonder if there's any point to any of this, to anything that we do. Many of us think that if we don't get a chance to verbally say the gospel at the end of all these efforts, there's no point. Now, if we think that, then we have missed the point. The point is that the lion has roared because we have all failed in our basic duty, let alone preach the gospel. For what has the Lord required of us, all of us human beings, but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God? And that's from Micah chapter 6, verse 8 to love our neighbour as we love God. And that's why Amos says in 5 verses 21 to 24, this is God saying, I hate, I despise your feasts. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs to the melody of your harps. I will not listen, but let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness, an ever-flowing stream. At the same time, the simplicity and beauty of living out this basic duty is this. In loving our neighbour, we become more like Jesus. The more we become like Jesus, the more our neighbour will taste and see that the Lord is good. And this is how we may proclaim the good news to the ends of the earth. We become the very good news of Jesus through our acts of love. How can justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream? It starts, it begins with loving the neighbours we encounter in our homes, our workplaces, our schools and our neighbourhoods today. It begins today, it begins in our hearts, it begins with our love for our neighbour and it ends at the end of the earth. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for your word. Help us to hear your word 
as you have wrought and reminded us of our basic duty, our basic duty to live justly and love, to love you and to love our neighbours. Well, to love you is to love our neighbours and to love our neighbours is to love you. And this is the basic duty of all of humanity, let alone us as Christians. All the more as Christians, our lives should reflect this. Help us, Lord, to begin today by taking notice of the people all around us, the small people, so to speak, that we often, often disregard or look down on or fail to take notice of. Help us to take notice of the things that are around us, the brokenness that's around us, the struggles of the people around us, their needs, their concerns and their lives. Help us take notice of us happening in our own lives, how we have failed you and how we have fallen short of living justly and righteously, of how in our small words and conduct and our tone of our voice and our choices, we have failed to do what is right to our fellow human beings who, are, who bear your image. Help us, Lord, to keep your word and to keep covenant with you by having faith that expresses itself through love, through love for the neighbour. And help us to begin today not with abstract ideas of love, but with tangible, practical steps of love. All this for your glory, we ask in your Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen.